Hey comrades and welcome back to the channel, I'm the Obnoxious Anarchist. Today I want to talk about disability and animal liberation. Stick around! Alright comrades, for this video, I want to look at the origins of the social model of disability as well as to define it. I'll also be looking at disability and its intersections with animal liberation, vegan feminist theory, as well as prison abolition theory. But firstly, I want to mention what the inspiration for this video was. In my video titled Identity Politics Explained, I referred to disabled people as differently abled. A comrade in the comments named Miss Stewart made it clear that no one refers to disabled people as differently abled and that I should familiarize myself with the social model of disability. So without hesitation I did a quick search and I was instantly intrigued. Right off the bat I had realized that referring to disabled peoples as differently abled removed from the equation the fact that disability is largely socially constructed. Also, I felt that there was a real lack of discussion about disability in the online left sphere. So here we are. So let's get started. According to Wikipedia, the approach can be traced to the 1960s and the specific term emerged from the United Kingdom in the 1980s. The history of the social model of disability begins with the history of the disability rights movement. In 1975, the UK organization Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation claimed, in our view, it is society which disables physically impaired people. Disability is something imposed on top of our impairments by the way we are unnecessarily isolated and excluded from full participation in society. This became known as the social interpretation or social definition of disability. And, in 1983, the disabled academic Mike Oliver coined the phrase, social model of disability. Now according to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, the social model understands disability as a relation between an individual and their social environment, the exclusion of people with certain physical and mental characteristics from major domains of social life. Their exclusion is manifested not only in deliberate segregation, but in a built environment and organized social activity that preclude or restrict the participation of people seen or labeled as having disabilities. The typical example here is that someone in a wheelchair is disabled from entering a store with stairs, but had a ramp been built in place of the stairs, that person would no longer be disabled. The social model of disability says that there's a clear distinction to be made between impairment and disability. In her article, Rethinking Disability, The Social Model of Disability and Chronic Disease, Sarah Goring writes, Disability is commonly viewed as a problem that exists in a person's body and requires medical treatment. The social model of disability, by contrast, distinguishes between impairment and disability, identifying the latter as a disadvantage that stems from a lack of fit between a body and its social environment. So, whereas the medical model looks at disability as solely an individual experience, the social model looks at society and how disability is socially constructed, all while making a distinction between impairment and disability, with impairment being of the individual and disability being recognized as a social oppression. So now that we have a basic understanding of the social model of disability, I'll define another term that's pertinent for this video, crip theory. According to Oxford Reference, the term crip emerged in disability movements as an adaptation or reworking of the derogatory word cripple. Crip, slang for cripple, is in the process of being reclaimed by people with disabilities. Crip theory began in communities and is an academic theory that intersects with experiences like race, class, or gender. And like the reclamation of the term queer in the LGBTQIA community, the term crip or cripple is being reclaimed by people with disabilities as a way to describe their experiences aside from, but always in connection with other social justice movements. In her book, Beasts of Burden, Animal and Disability Liberation, Sonara Taylor writes that the word crip which comes from cripple, has been adopted by disability activists and scholars in a way that is similar to how LGBT activists and scholars have reclaimed the word queer. She writes, Many disabled people identify as crips, and to crip something doesn't mean to break it, but to radically and creatively invest it with disability history, politics, and pride, while simultaneously questioning paradigms of independence, normalcy, and medicalization. 
Taylor also says that, like anti-racist and feminist scholars before them, disability scholars realize that words reinforce how we are treated socially and politically every day. Now, Sonora Taylor's book is titled Beasts of Burden, Animal and Disability Liberation. But how do animals tie into all of this? Well, the third part of her book is called I Am an Animal. And here, Taylor explains her own experiences with being disabled and at times being compared to other animals in a derogatory way while growing up. It was here that Taylor really started to see the connections between herself as a disabled person and other non-human animals who are also socially oppressed. She writes, I remember knowing that my kindergarten classmates meant to hurt my feelings when they told me I walked like a monkey, and of course they did. I wasn't exactly sure why it should hurt my feelings, however, after all, monkeys were my favorite animal. I had dozens of monkey toys. My parents recall that my favorite thing as a toddler was to go to our local miniature golf course to see the giant King Kong. But still I knew that when the other children compared me to a monkey, they were not doing it to flatter me. It was an insult. I understood that they were commenting on my inability to stand completely upright when out of my wheelchair, my failure to stand like a normal human being. I understood that being told I was like an animal separated me from other people. And I mean it's undeniable, we do animalize people in society as a way of degrading them. We call people dogs, and swine, and fat cows, and dirty pigs. We animalize to insult, and we animalize to systematically dehumanize certain groups of people. Outspoken women being referred to as female dogs. Black people being referred to as monkeys. Or indigenous people being referred to as savages and animals. The list goes on. Angela Davis writes, I think there is a connection between the way we treat animals and the way we treat people who are at the bottom of the hierarchy. Look at the ways in which people who commit such violence on other human beings have often learned to enjoy that by enacting violence on animals. Writer and vegan activist Afko writes, the position that non-human animals occupy in our cultural imagination is proof for how easy it is to accept the lower status of some beings without even a second thought. Alright comrades, I'll just end this part with one last quote. Christopher Sebastian McJeeters, a vegan activist and scholar, writes, Veganism is an act of political resistance and frankly, it wouldn't hurt you to show solidarity with marginalized persons who are living with state-sanctioned violence because they don't share your species community. We're here to abolish hierarchies, not perpetuate them. Now let's refer back to the social model of disability. The social model posits impairment as an individual experience, while disability is a social oppression. Earlier I mentioned the example of our social infrastructure, saying that stairs disable people in wheelchairs from accessing certain places. Can we think of any other examples where infrastructure completely disables someone? Personally, I think of prisoners and farm animals. In an interview for the Journal for Critical Animal Studies, Sonara Taylor says, Disability is everywhere in animal agriculture, and especially factory farms. The animals people eat are largely manufactured to be disabled. Animals are bred to have too much muscle for their bodies to hold. Cows and chickens develop broken bones and osteoporosis from the overproduction of milk and eggs. Very often, the very thing that animals are bred for is, or leads to, disability. They're also disabled through mutilation, through abuse, and through dangerous and toxic environments. Even my disability, arthrogryposis, is found on farms. In cows, it's known as curly calf. I mean, that's a quote that largely speaks for itself. Animals in factory farms especially are completely disabled by the infrastructure of the meat and dairy industries. Let's continue now on the subject of prison. Angela Davis says, Prisons do not disappear social problems. They disappear human beings. Homelessness, unemployment, drug addiction, mental illness, and illiteracy are only a few of the problems that disappear from public view when the human beings contending with them are relegated to cages. In prisons, we remove all individuality and we close the person off. Every nuance ripped from them and the social problems that lead to most crime ignored. Similarly, in factory farms, we forget about the individual. We forget about the sociality in other animals. And in many ways, we lose our humanity in the name of the welfare of the individuals we're about to confine, then kill. In prisons, we strip people from their families and we confine and abuse them in the name of rehabilitation of the individual. We're certainly living in upside down times, but through an intersectional framework, we can coalition build to destroy what destroys us. 
In conclusion, we've looked at the social model of disability and how disability issues connect with animal liberation, feminism, and prison abolition. But I want to make one thing clear here, that I'm only looking at the similarities between critical race, disability, and animal studies based on social oppression and the presence of a victim. There are obvious differences in how that social oppression manifests, but for this video, I wanted to focus on the similarities more as a way of analyzing the oppression of others in society and how we can stop it. As Sonara Taylor writes, if animal and disability oppression are entangled, might not that mean that their paths of liberation are entangled as well? If you enjoyed this content, remember to like, subscribe, and hit that bell. Until next time, solidarity comrades.